Hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm Peter Goldstein, founder of We Did It, and I'm so glad that you're here joining us. We have a very special guest today, and we'll introduce him in a minute. But first, please allow me to take a moment to tell you a little bit about us and what our mission is and what we're doing. So we are We Did It, and our vision is to help create a healthy, happy, well-fed vegan world. Our unique role is to empower vegan and plant-based consumers to be effective ambassadors. Imagine as an ambassador being able to confidently open more doors and plant more seeds wherever your day takes you. Our work consists of three pillars. And that's with it first is interpersonal communication skills so that we can listen and communicate more effectively, meet people where they are and, and be effective ambassadors and plant the best seeds possible. Our second pillar is resource curation. And that's about having at our fingertips all the most appropriate resources that we can share with somebody depending on their situation. And the third pillar of our work is community. So we're, we're building communities so we can support each other as we face the world, trying to spread the word and being the best ambassadors we can be. I hope you enjoy our conversation today. Please type your questions and we will do our best to get to having a conversation and including them in our conversation. Then please join us follow our work by joining our Facebook groups and subscribing to our YouTube channel. If you are plan-based, also please chime in with our scoreboard at wedidit.health so that we can show the world how effective a plan-based lifestyle is for preventing, reversing chronic diseases, for the health of the planet and for the health of animal kingdom and animal justice. So with that, I would like to welcome my my team member, Marquita Solis, and she will talk a little bit about our, our very special guest today and introduce him. So hello, Marquita. Hi, everybody. I'm excited to be here. Thank you, Peter. Yes, we are so blessed today and honored to have this amazing guest. And let me ask everyone also first, if you're watching on StreamYard, please give StreamYard permission to use your name because we want to know who's out there and tell us where you're joining from. And we want to hear your comments and questions. So that's very important. So thank you again for joining us. And today we have Dr. Will Tuttle, who is a visionary, the visionary author of the acclaimed bestseller, The World Peace Diet. And this has been published in 17 languages. And Dr. Tuttle is a recipient of the Courage of Conscious Award and the Empty Cages Prizes. He's also the author of several other books on spirituality, intuition, and social justice, as well as the creator of online wellness and advocacy programs. A 40-year vegan and a former Zen monk, he's featured in a number of documentaries and is a frequent radio, television, and online presenter. So we are tremendously honored to have Dr. Tuttle here with us today, bringing on all of his wisdom, all of his knowledge and experience and his wonderful tips on how to get through this holiday season with family and friends. So thank you so much, Dr. Will, for joining us. And let's get him on here. <laughs> all right. <laughs> I'm delighted to be here. Thank you, Peter, for the great work that you're doing with We Did It, and thank you, Marquita. It's always good to see you and your beautiful, shining, radiant self and uh, helping to bring this uh, fantastic message. It's really the gospel. You know, the gospel means good news, the good news of the basic fact that all of us as human beings have been given the gift of a physical body that does not require any animals to be imprisoned or harmed in order to get all the nutrients that we need to celebrate our lives on this beautiful earth. And the more, like you say, Peter, the more we can be ambassadors for this message, the more effectively we can do that, the better I think it is obviously for everyone. And the more I think we're fulfilling our mission on this earth in this lifetime, 
which is uh, an important thing to be aware of, I think, especially nowadays when uh, it, there's so many challenges that we're facing on so many levels. So I'm delighted to be here. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, we're, we're hoping that uh, to start the conversation, we'd love to hear a little bit about your work and, and uh, how people can be involved with it and support it. And also then we'd love to hear uh, from your perspective, some of the pointers that you would like to share with the ambassadors so that, you know, part of, part of our mission here at this moment is uh, we're doing this thrive and inspire through the holiday series because being with family, being with friends at this time of the year is extra daunting and challenging. So if you can share some of your pointers, how we can be more influential and, and, and not have to suffer emotionally for for all the all the terrible things that some some of us have experienced in the past. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay. So uh, I'm I'm happy to talk about that. The the basic thing with my work really is right in alignment with what you're talking about. It's how we can embody what veganism is. If we're already vegan, if we're not, if we're pre-vegans, then how we can just basically open to all the many benefits that we can accrue for ourselves and for others uh, by questioning the official narratives in our society regarding food. So right now at this moment, I am in New Mexico at Elephant Butte State Park. I'm looking out over this gigantic uh, reservoir, this lake. It's the the uh, the Rio Grande is dammed up, and it's a huge lake. We've been here for a few days. This is so. This is by um, solar power. We have solar panels on this little micro. I'm in a tiny micro van. So Madeline and I are living for four and a half months in a space that is 48 square feet. <laughs> so. <laughs> we get to know each other really well and uh, but we've been happily married for 30 years so it's not too too difficult <laughs> but um, I'm and we're connected up with my cell phone so I'm hoping that the technology will work okay uh, just to say that at the beginning and so uh, we're, we're kind of hanging by a thread but I, I'm really glad to be able to do this we'll be giving a lecture uh, in Las Cruces uh, this tonight and tomorrow we just gave lectures promoting veganism in Santa Fe in Albuquerque a few days ago, and then we're on our way to Texas and Florida on this lecture tour. It's called the Benevolent Revolution Tour. So uh, part of our, a lot of our work really is in grassroots advocacy, connecting people at the grassroots. And uh, so I wrote the book, as you mentioned earlier, uh, Marikita, The World Peace Diet, which I think has um, helped uh, transform a lot of people's lives and that's what i've heard we've it's been translated into all these languages so we've been able to travel all over into all 50 states over 50 countries in the world in asia africa uh, europe pretty much everywhere all over the middle east and so forth to bring this message and uh, I, I think there's a, a a growing awareness that if we don't uh, succeed in moving to a plant-based way of eating and living, then our chances of survival really are getting very slim in many ways because of the, not only the, the physical health problems that we're having, but especially the environmental devastation. And as I point out in the World Peace Diet, world hunger, because uh, it's really important to understand that animal agriculture is just ridiculously wasteful of resources, especially land and water and petroleum and causes enormous amounts of pollution that lead to deforestation and water depletion and water pollution and all kinds of devastation to the oceans. I mean, the environmental impacts are just horrific of animal agriculture. And that also contributes to conflict in the world and war and when you have nuclear weapons and so forth. So it's really fundamentally important to understand these outer uh, problems that animal agriculture causes. But the main thrust of my work actually has been to also shed light on the inner uh, damage that is done to us by living in a society that's organized around animal agriculture. So I think it's important to talk about that or to understand that. Um, and so, the, but the main point I want to say here as far as effective advocacy is that we just tell our own story. 
instead of trying to look, point our finger at the other person and telling them that they should know better and what they're doing is causing trouble and so forth, it just makes people uh, feel defensive. And we already have that problem. And, and I think the main problem in the vegan movement in many ways is that if we go vegan, we start to learn more about the consequences of animal agriculture. And pretty soon we feel like we really are an expert. <laughs> and then we want to shake everybody. That's how I was. I wanted to shake everybody until they went vegan. I'm not going to stop shaking you till you go vegan, you know, that kind of a thing, because it's really important. But the, we have to understand that if like if someone were to come up to me and look at me and act with me as if I'm basically wrong and bad and I should be like them, the natural healthy response is to fight back, you know, leave me alone. I'm, you know, and so that's what we're, we're just not going to get anywhere if we have that attitude because we just create more resistance. So, uh, and, and the other thing is we think that since we're vegan, we're basically perfect and everybody else is the problem. We're not the problem. They're the problem. So this, this whole thing is very understandable and people and vegans are well-meaning, but we have to realize that we need to learn number one, to listen to other people and not always tell them and number two, uh, even more importantly, I think, or just as important to not tell them what they should do, but talk about what we have done and how wonderful it is because people cannot argue with our own story. If I just tell my own story, this is what happened and do it in a way that's friendly and with love and authentic, authentically loving, you know, be authentically caring about other people because that's really what veganism is at its core. It's caring. That's the word caring. I care about animals. I care about ecosystems. I care about hungry people. I care about slaughterhouse workers. I care about indigenous people. I care about future generations. Like, you know, it's caring, caring about my health. All these things are really important to care. So it's important also to care about the people we're speaking to and in that way, not that we're trying to change them <laughs> because that that's a form of violence. Really, if I come along and want to change someone, but rather, like you said, you said to plant seeds, we can plant seeds effectively though, or we can plant seeds ineffectively. And I think the most effective way, like I say, is to generate this feeling of love, not only for the non-human animals, it's not, Really that difficult to care about cows and pigs and chickens because they don't go around insulting us and um, making us feel judged and wronged and all that but to actually work in a kind and loving way with other human beings the human animals so to speak that's where the spiritual work is so important it's important for us to do the inner work that we actually develop a, a way of seeing others that's not judgmental and instead of blaming them and shaming and criticizing people that we see that basically they've been wounded they've been you know we've all been wounded by being raised like i was in a society eating animal food so i did it for the first 20 whatever two or three years of my life i think it was and then i went vegetarian and uh, i guess 22 and then about five years later i went vegan and so that was back in 1980 and it, but it took a lot it, and it was other people's example really that helped me the most seeing uh, healthy vegetarians and healthy vegans and and uh, i think when we can just be an example and then tell our own story so i'll just end this little part by saying that i think if we uh, want to uh, be effective tell our story in a very positive way in a way that's not uh, in sort of confronting people and, and, and short and simple, not, not going to a big long thing typically, because if we just keep it short and simple, then people go, hmm, okay. And just, so the idea is just plant the seed and then let go. <laughs> Don't try to, you know, give a big long thing unless they really have questions. Of course, then you can answer, but the basic gist would be this. I'm so happy and, and grateful that I discovered that the only reason I was eating animal foods all those years that I did was because I was just following orders. And then I realized it wasn't in my best interest, so I'm not doing it anymore. And it's fantastic. That's it. That's all you have to say. It's just like three main points. The only reason I was doing it was because I was following orders. I realized it wasn't a good idea and it's fantastic that I'm not doing it anymore. Those three points, because that's true for everyone. There's the, when we go out into the world and we see people whether they're just strangers or they're our closest friends and neighbors and family, that's the only reason anyone eats animal foods. 
took me a while to figure that out is because we're following orders, orders that were basically injected into us by very loving, well-meaning people who wanted to make sure we got enough calcium and protein and ate a lot of cheese and meat so we'd be healthy. You know, it's just a, it's a wound. It's, it's total, totally erroneous, but people believe it because they we've all been deceived by being raised in this society. So people believe that you have to do it. So just saying, gosh, you know, I, I discovered I was just following orders and they weren't really very good. For, and then if you know the person's particular procliv proclivities you, and they care about the environment or they care about animals, you can say, and I realized it was really you know, causing a lot of suffering to animals. And I'm not doing it anymore and it's fantastic. And then let go because that way they're not feeling pressured really you can just let go like the bhagavad gita says you know don't be attached to the fruit of your actions just do what do the right thing and let go and then their own wisdom and their own compassion will gradually water the seed that you have planted and then as that happens that little plant grows inside them that vegan little beautiful sprout grows and they think about it later and if you do it really well they'll forget who you are they won't even remember you you know just just plant the seed and then at some point they'll go, hmm, and I'm going to try that vegan thing, you know, because I think when we plant the seed, it really, it's a, it's a seed of truth. And truth is something that resonates with all of us at our core. And, this, and, and we know, I think, at a deep level collectively that the way we're living is not in harmony with nature. It's not in harmony with, the, with our true nature and causing violence and eating violence and toxicity it's pretty hard to just you can't justify it except that it's habit and it's tradition and i'm afraid to change it's just fear really so when we plant the seed and we do it positively then we just open the door to the to the prison that, that you have just opened the door they can walk out of that prison you've just showed them like i walked out you can walk out of the prison if you want and they'll some people will go well I'm going to, I'm going to walk out of the prison slowly, <laughs> slowly get there and gradually become a vegan. That's good. Or some people just walk out. You can just walk out right now if you want, you know, there's nothing stopping. There's not, nothing holding you there except maybe what your friends and family might judge you for not eating their food anymore. And that, and that keeps people in the prison uh, quite a bit. But if we can learn to realize that every time we do something that's loving in the world, even if it goes against the tribal um, you know, morality, it actually is good for everybody. So that's the basic uh, perspective I have on advocacy. I think it's a very fine art. I mean, it, uh, you know, we, I've been doing this for 42 years as a vegan activist, and I'm still learning every day. I mean, we still, there's always more to learn. We can always become more effective in our advocacy. We can always be more spiritually evolved so that we're intuitive to what people will resonate to. And we can be always be more loving. So I think it's a never ending path of spiritual and psychological and intellectual growth. It's not just a like I'm vegan or not vegan. It just it's a never ending uh, path. Yeah. That's beautiful. Wow. Absolutely. Yeah, I and I I love your messages and you know we're what we're doing is we're building a platform to amplify everybody's voices and I I'm just so excited this is this is the first time we interact and I really hope that we'll have lots more and we can we can help share your messaging with with the community we're building. Um, yeah, I, so many things you've said I I love I love I love that you say it's a truth and. And it is uh, to me. It's you know as true as you know. If you drop a ball, it falls to the ground. That's absolute truth. And and about everything about being plant based and that being an absolute truth. This is where humanity needs to go, and it's an absolute truth. So really, we're advocating for something that is true. So um, it's it's a it's a good thing. It's an easy thing, easy in that we never have to doubt it. Um, I love it. You know, I would love to hear you talk a little bit more about spirituality. And I've, I've always felt that this is very spiritual and, and bringing spirituality into, into this whole platform is something that we haven't talked about yet. Uh, but I'd love to hear you talk a little more about it. Right. Well, thank you. 
And, and you're right. You know, I've, like I said, I've, I've given, I, you know, I, I over 4,000 lectures all over the world and they pretty much all of them have a Q and A. And so I've heard literally, I think every possible question <laughs> that anyone can hear trying to find a way to wriggle out of veganism or, and compassion for animals. And you're right. There, there is no, I've never heard anything. And no one that, that made me go, Hmm, maybe, yeah, maybe I should eat some meat. You know, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah, there isn't, there is no, it's like trying to justify raping or whatever. I mean, you, it's like, no, no, it's not, it's unnecessary violence. It's not necessary. And that's the beautiful truth that we, there are no nutrients that are in um, animal-based foods that didn't come originally from plants. So, so if we eat the plants directly, we can get all the vitamins and minerals and protein and carbohydrates and lipids and, and fiber, which there isn't any in animal-based foods. And car you know, carbohydrates is none of those either. The main, most important things are not even in animal foods. So, uh, so the truth is like so solidly on our side. I mean, it's just so totally solid that we could feed everyone on a fraction of the land. I mean, just imagining a vegan world is imagining a, a world we can't even imagine. It's so, the, the possibilities are so beautiful of how we could live in harmony without, without harming the earth and ecosystems. I mean, what it would do to us psychologically to not be causing violence every single day by taking out our wallets and paying other people to stab and, and rape animals and then eating that and feeding it to our children. We have no idea how absolutely devastating that actually is to the inner landscape of our consciousness because it's been normalized through 10,000 years of creating a culture, but we crossed a line 10,000 years ago. We should never have crossed. And we started hurt, owning animals as property, enslaving them, and then deliberately impregnating them and stealing their babies and killing their babies. I mean, we had to shut down our spiritual consciousness to do that. We had to. We had to shut down what I refer to in the World Peace Diet as Sophia, which is uh, the Greek goddess of wisdom, which represents the inner spiritual uh, yearning to love and care and support and nurture life. It's the foundation of a healthy child, right? If a little baby is born and the mother for some reason doesn't have Sophia energy, she just doesn't care about that baby, I mean, that baby is going to be really wounded and be physically and mentally and every on every level very sick and maybe would die. So this Sophia energy is in men and women. We have this capacity. I think women have it even maybe more, this natural yearning to love and care for life. And it's the foundation of the healthy individuals, of healthy families, of a healthy society. And what animal agriculture does, though, it suppresses Sophia in all of us because we have to eat terror and pain. We have to just not think about, I don't care about pigs and cows and chickens. We don't care about hungry people. That's the subtext of every meal is we don't care. We don't connect. The subtext of every meal is disconnectedness not making the connections. You know, my PhD at Berkeley was in, in education and I studied intelligence. And intelligence, the definition of intelligence is the capacity to make connections. So if you have the main ritual in every society, which is eating meals together, that's the fun foundational ritual that is the main way that any society transmits its values from generation to generation, that that ritual is basically eroding the intelligence of people, not only the cognitive intelligence, but the ethical intelligence, the uh, emotional intelligence, and the spiritual intelligence of everyone in that society. Every single day, maybe two or three times a day, we, we don't make the connection. We stay shallow. We don't look deeply. We don't care deeply. We don't feel deeply. It's just bacon. It's just cheese. We don't think about the being. We learn to become very skilled at staying shallow and not knowing what we're doing. And so we become a tragic society. You know, I used to teach college courses in the, in the Greek tragedies. The tragic hero is someone who has two main character defects. One is hubris, which is pride, thinking I'm superior to everybody else. And the other is this, this obtuseness, this inability to make connections just doesn't get it, you know? <laughs> that defines our society today. We are very proud and we're very obtuse. 
And it's not a it's not a criticism. It's just that's the wound that animal agriculture inflicts on us when we're born into a society and we are compelled to sit there and eat terrible suffering and violence and not think about it by everybody. Then it just that's what it does. And so essentially what we're talking about with we did it and with with the veganism is a, is a himsa. A himsa is the old Sanskrit word that means nonviolence. It's the foundational spiritual principle in all the world religions and it's resurrecting sophia it's resurrecting this basic inner feminine wisdom in all of us to love and care for and nurture life and not only others but ourselves to really respect ourselves we can never have self-respect if we're not respecting other living beings who have interests and we all know in our society that cows and pigs and chickens are like dogs and cats people have dogs and cats they know when they look at their dog or cat as their companion animal there's a little being there's a being in there that has interests to her or him that are as significant to them as mine are to me and we would never allow someone to come in and and, and buy them by the pound and lock them up in a closet and make them live in their own excrement and hang them upside down you know we would never allow that because we care about them well we obviously can care about other living beings as well that are just as sentient and capable of suffering. And when we don't, that is, is the essence of a spiritual disconnect. Spirituality and veganism are absolutely identical. There's no difference between them. They're the same fundamental reality. Veganism is, is ahimsa, nonviolence. It's the golden rule. The golden rule is the core of the world religions. I mean, every religion, remember when we went to China, it was so great to, to go to uh, the city of Chufu where, where Confucianism started and they had right up there, he, Confucius way back around 500 BC wrote, do not do to others what you would not want to have done to yourself. We are capable of suffering, we know that. And so that feeling of suffering, no one wants to suffer. And if we, if we inflict suffering on others, we have a natural healthy sense of empathy to, to not do that because <laughs> we know what it's like ourselves. So when we break that day after day, causing suffering to others, we can't, we have to disconnect from that. So the world religions uh, all honor at the core this, this teaching. Uh, and that's the beautiful thing. I, I, I also used to teach college courses in comparative religion and every religion agrees on that, that the, the essential teaching is whatever you most want for yourself give that to others basic teaching and it also links in with the other main teaching in all the world religions which is whatever you sow so shall you reap what we put out always comes back so for us to be so naive and gullible to think that we can sow the seeds of disease and violence and misery millions of times every day in, our, in the United States, or actually billions, when we include marine animals, it's billions of times every single day and expect that we uh, are worthy of a society of freedom and joy and health and peace for ourselves while we're riding on this ocean of suffering that we're inflicting. These animals are in our hands. They're, they're in our hands, each one of them. And we can let them live their lives and be free or we can just crush them and, and abuse them. But we, and that's what we do. We, it's not that we're bad people. It's just that we've been programmed by a cultural indoctrination by the people we trust the most. Our parents and friends and teachers and neighbors and relatives, the minister, the doctor, the mainstream media, everything. It's a united front that this is how we have to do it. God told us to do it, you know, it's like even in the religion, more or less. So um, that's the thing. So, so veganism is spirituality, and yet we have to remember there's a, a basic difference between spirituality and religion there's two there's two uh, interesting points i'll make just very briefly one is that religion ha well religion has these two two uh, missions one mission of religion is to authentically uh, support spirituality it is i mean that's that's the beautiful thing about religion that's very important science does not have that mission we have to really understand that science has nothing to do uh, with ethics or, or, or spiritual growth. In fact, it's in many ways, it's against it. I'm really, really realizing that science is very dangerous. But the point is that religion is, has this beautiful 
uh, core of caring and uh, and teaching spirituality and the golden rule. That, that's in there. The other, but the problem is that the other uh, mission of religion is to support the society that it's in, like to basically support the cultural narrative of whatever society it's in. And so if that society is a herding culture, like we live in a society organized around herding animals, then basically the religion finds ways to support that. It, because otherwise they get another, you have to get another religion. So I think the founders of, of the religion, like if you really look back in, in Jesus and many of these great sages and saints in, in, in the past, they were in compassion for animals. I think there's, there's a lot of truth to that. And same thing with the, in Buddhism and other traditions. And so it's very interesting to me that in other societies, like in, especially in Asia, where there was not such a strong herding uh, culture, the religion, like when you, when you say thou shalt not kill in Christianity and Islam and Judaism, that means humans. It doesn't mean animals. They say, well, that's, that's okay to kill animals, but that's just humans. But in, in Taoism, Buddhism, Confucianism, most forms of Hinduism, not killing means not killing any sentient being, really. That's what they say. I mean, when I'm, I was a Zen Buddhist monk in Korea, and that was really one of the things that, that deepened my understanding of uh, veganism because and I was a vegan here uh, and then I went over I shaved my head I became a Zen Buddhist monk and I was living in this monastery in South Korea and I realized I was in a community in South Korea this Zen Buddhist community that had been practicing veganism for 750 years you know since since the seven since 1200 something or other and so I realized that they were doing it out of a spiritual teaching that if you're really sincere about spiritual awakening and you're sincere about creating a society of peace and justice and freedom and equality and sustainability, then animal agriculture, you can never support that. That's violence against other sentient beings. So they understood that like hundreds of years ago, I would say thousands of years ago, this was understood. And it's part of the basic sanity of our uh, and spiritual heritage of humanity is that understanding but that's understanding has been suppressed so but it was so great when i would go to say china and taiwan and vietnam and korea the the buddhist uh community they would pay for my flight you know they would pay for me to come and and spread the vegan message and they were trying to get people to go vegan because that's part of the teaching of that um, of Northern Buddhism, of, of East Asian Buddhism. And I remember coming back to the United States and thinking, gosh, it really would be great if the Christian churches or these other, you know, would just pay to spread the vegan message because that's part of the teaching. It's a real basic uh, teaching of kindness and compassion for, for animals and humans and future generations. Of course, it should be part of the teaching. But it, but it's so far, uh, it's it, it's it's um, it's very much one of those things where there's a lot of dissonance. You know, they, I think religious people know that the golden rule really would apply to animals, and so they're uncomfortable with the whole thing. But gradually, I think if we just keep at it, it's and and keep planting seeds, it'll become more and more undeniable. And that this is part of, of the way it is. And, and it's, we are making progress. I mean, there's progress being made. Uh, it's, it's not easy because we have this huge 10,000 years of inertia. But spirituality is essentially the uh, awareness, the direct awareness that what I am is a manifestation of consciousness. See, this is the key problem in our society is that animal agriculture leads to philosophical materialism because we're buying and selling animals by the pound. You cannot get more completely diluted into the depths of materialism than to buy a living being by the pound. That, that's, the ultimate, that's the ultimate ultimate. And we do it mil billions of times every day in our society. I mean, I, on one level, I have to wonder, how do I tolerate living in a society that is so grossly materialistic? The most materialistic society in the history of the earth that's selling billions of animals by the pound. And so we have a philosophical materialism that's just 
injected into us at such a deep level. And that's the absolute opposite of spirituality. It's, it's seeing beings as objects to be used, to be manipulated, to see a being merely as matter, as an object that was born and will die. And when we do that to millions of animals, pretty soon we see ourselves that way. I'm just, a, I was just, I'm just an object that was born and will die. I'm just a thing that in a meaningless universe. That's what science, I mean, this big bang and random mutation of everything. And it's nothing has any meaning. It just sort of happens somehow. There's nothing. And we're just objects. Then you want to enslave people. You teach them that because that reduces their basic sense of being connected to a, a magnificent, intelligent uh, universe that what they are is consciousness. We all know that. If And the thing is, though, we're not taught in our society to meditate or to engage seriously in self-inquiry, to go deep in, into the question of what am I? What is this being? And if we do, if we can, if we can actually meditate effectively enough and practice, I was born and raised in a musical family and I learned to practice. I had to practice the piano every day. And I realized when you practice something, you get good at it. We practice materialism, we get really good at it. If we practice meditation and quieting the mind and learning to listen internally and take a few hours every day just to watch the mind and when the mind thinks the thought to let it go, eventually we'll get to the point where we can begin to glimpse the infinite, eternal, radiant sky of our true nature, which was never born and will never die. And when, when we get those glimpses, we realize the love and joy and absolute complete freedom and creativity that are our true nature. And we look at others and we see the same thing that looks out of my eyes is looking out of their eyes. It's the same source. We all have the same source. Other human beings and all living beings were all manifestations of the loving essence of life that gives that births this entire universe and it's not material. It's consciousness, it's spirituality at its core. It binds us together. When we see that then we, we are living a vegan life. I mean, we naturally are drawn to that because we realize that it's like this finger is going to fight against this finger. You know, <laughs> we're, all, we're all fingers on the same hand in a sense. And so I think when the, this understanding is what really creates uh, a sense of living a vegan life that is on a, the most solid foundation because we realize it's not an option. It's not like, well, I could be, or I could be. We realize it's really our true nature. And it's and it's a joy. It's an absolute joy. It's an absolute, I mean, to, to do anything else would be ridiculous. It would be, it would be unthinkable. So I think the whole idea is to, uh, to try to help people, because a lot of vegans are sort of anti-religion, even anti-spirituality, because they they went to church and there was a fish fry and the barbecue and they think all oh, these religions, they're all hypocritical, I hate religion, I hate spirituality. Don't go there. <laughs> I mean, religion, uh, it's not perfect, but there's a deep underlying foundation of the golden rule. And as you sow, so shall you reap. I mean, these are really important ideas that are not in science. And, and we do, we have to be careful. We have to be very careful and keep uh, the, um, the yearning inside of us to discover our true nature and to realize that if we don't understand what we are and, and we just fall for the cultural narrative that we're just an object, then we're in many ways imprisoned in delusion and we're deceived. And that deception, I'll just say this is the last thing I'll say about this. Deception is really rampant right now. And animal agriculture is the main, one of the main deceptions. But it's very important to understand this because if we're harmed by someone, usually we know we've been harmed, right? If someone comes up and hits us or they, they abuse us, they steal something from us, we're like, wow, I got harmed. But if someone comes up and deceives us, we've been harmed, but we don't even know it. We have no idea. It's like... We think they're the greatest person. We believe everything. We, but we that's how we get enslaved, is that we've lost the ability to see when we've been deceived. And we are being deceived so much and harmed, but we don't see it. So, we, so I want to really emphasize to everyone, the greatest gift we can give to the world in many ways 
is to cultivate our discriminating awareness so that we can not we can connect authentically with our inner intuition that understands the truth of things and connect with the truth and when we do that and and, and no one can do that for someone else we, we that's something we have to do and then live that truth because the truth is under attack and living in an animal agriculture society it's 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 teaching it's deceiving us from the very the time we're born and when we can overcome that basic deception and then keep questioning, don't stop there, question all the cultural narratives about everything, we can find much greater health, joy, and freedom and co-create a world of beauty and love as each one of us takes responsibility for the quality of our awareness of what is the truth and what in our, the quality of our relationships, the quality of our health. Don't depend on others. This is something we each need to do ourselves. Yes, that, that's so true. And, and I love the spirituality and awaken to that. And, and you know, we, we, we learn things sometimes and then we hold on to them. But so I love that explore the newness here, right, about spirituality. And I wanted to know about, I mean, I know a lot of people are struggling with the holidays. How do you go if you're, if, you know, a lot of people think these are bad people, right? They're eating meat. Or, right, how can these people eat meat? I don't want to be with my family at the holidays. How can we mend those? Or what would you recommend to the people that are out there that are isolating themselves and really sad? And and how can they be understanding to other people? How can they bring that compassion, this beautiful compassion, right? That, that, that I feel like the spirit of veganism is compassion. How can they bring that to people that have not yet seen the light? Thank you. That's great, Marikita. I would say... The most important thing is to cultivate a, a long view, <laughs> you know, a long, it, it may take a while, you know, so when we, when we're dealing with just strangers, then we can plant the seed and we're not that attached to it. It's like, we hope that they go vegan. That'd be good for them. Good for everybody. When it's our mother, our father, our children, our, our spouse, you know, that our relatives, it's much, it, it, the claws can bite into us. You know, they, we, we go to dinner with them, the, the turkey's on the table, maybe. We've told them, we, you know, we, we don't want to do that. I mean, it's very emotional, very emotional and, and stressful because they feel that we re, we're rejecting them and we maybe feel that they're rejecting us. And we, so to find, you know, essentially, I, I've been going through this for, for many years, but the idea is to um, try to, First of all, not blame anybody. Just understand that everyone has their programming. And the programming, we had it at one point ourselves. And just because we've been able to see through it, it doesn't mean that others uh, are bad if they haven't. I, I like the, um, the metaphor of a, of a tree. You know, we, we've planted about 70 fruit trees in, in where we live in Northern California. And the, the fruits don't always ripen at the same time. <laughs> you know, some, some ripen way before the others. And I don't go up to the ones that haven't ripened yet and start yelling at them and say, you stupid apple, you know, what the heck's wrong with you? You should have been ripened. Your other one's already ripe, what's wrong with you? You know, you know they'll, it, it will ripen. It's, everyone, they all have their own rhythm. They all have their own nature. They all have their own whatever. And so to just understand that and understand that the, we've been wounded in different ways, some people more severely than others, people who are more wounded maybe have a harder time getting over it. And, and when someone's wounded, you don't go up and spit on them and kick them and yell at them and say how bad they are that they've been wounded. The natural tendency when someone's wounded is to be loving and try to help them and try to shine some light or, or give them some tea or whatever. So I think just be understanding that people are where they are and we're not going to accelerate the process by in any way being abusive or or feeling that they're abusing us don't take things personally there's a great story from the Taoist tradition about a guy uh who was out on a lake and he was enjoying the lake so much in a boat and he was lying on the boat and he was looking up at this clouds drifting by in the sky and he was just so relaxed and so happy and then all of a sudden bam you know he, like some other boat ran into him and he was laying there and he's thinking what a jerk what a stupid person who could have just didn't care they just ran right into me so he's, he gets up he's ready to fight you know he's really angry to yell 
and he and he sees this boat that hit him is empty <laughs> there's no one in the boat it was just pushed by the wind and ran into him so he starts laughing we have to realize it's all empty boats people are driven by the winds of their conditioning and they bang into you, you there's no point in yelling at the empty boat it, it's just that's what it is it's an empty boat it's it, there's no it's not trying to make you upset or whatever people have been wounded and, and are drifting in the in the wind <laughs> so when we understand that then we can relax a little bit and plant the seeds and what i discovered is i've been you know at this long enough I, for years, I was working with my sister and my mother and, and to try to get them to see the light, you know, and, and sometimes it went pretty well and sometimes it did. And I remember at one point, my, my sister got upset with me and she slammed the door and she walked out and she said, you vegans, you know, you think you're so self-righteous and you're so right all the time. And I thought, well, I, I guess I went a little too far that time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you just, you just do our best. But I kept the conversation going over the years. The years went by, and I would send links to videos and this and that. And 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 when we eat, I would we would Madeline and I we would we would always bring healthy vegan food that we could share and you know show them. And and she was part of a very uh, fundamentalist Christian community, so it was very difficult. They were all you know pretty much into eating animal foods. And um, at one point though. I got an email from my sister and, and she said, I just want you to know that the Lord came to me and told me to go vegan. And that was like, that was probably 17 years ago. So it took me probably 20, or at least 15 years to get her, for that to happen. But now it's been you know, 17 years of one, 17 wonderful times where we get together, have a vegan Thanksgiving, a vegan, whatever it is. And her daughter is vegan. Her daughter has four children that are all vegan from birth. My mother went vegan also at the same time. And um, so it took me 15 years, right? So some people say, well, I say, how long have you been trying to get your family to go vegan? They say, well, I've been trying for two years. I think, well, all right, well, you know, just relax. It'll take a while maybe. <laughs> it might take 15 years, you know. But whatever. It may, it may never go. I don't know. But the whole idea is to just do our best and and uh, we keep planting the seeds uh then uh and and don't and don't don't feel like we have to pressure it to happen we just we have to do do our best that's i, I guess what i can say and be loving in the situation and keep and, and keep uh questioning our own uh sense of of righteousness about these things because really yeah, we're right, but there's many other factors involved in people's lives. And so just keep planting the seed with love. And that's because getting upset, all it does is hurt us. I mean, it just hurts our own body. And we, to be effective vegan advocates, we need to be healthy. So it's important that we uh, have emotional maturity, that we don't take things like that personally, and we do the best we can to uh, to create harm harmony in our life. And what we've done also where we've lived is we always create a vegan Thanksgiving and invite everybody to come. So we've had, you know, 40, 50, 60 people come to a vegan Thanksgiving. for So, so there's a lot of times vegans, like, what am I going to do? So get together with other vegans and, and create vegan Thanksgivings in your community and do that. That's another thing you can do. And then tell your, your family if, if it's really not working, say, you know, I'm with you in spirit, but we're having a vegan Thanksgiving here and, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see you in another time or however you want to do it. But I think uh, it's good to be proactive, to take our whatever energy we have and turn it into something positive rather than uh, fret about something negative. Create something positive, create delicious vegan food and share it somehow. Beautiful. That's beautiful. Yes. Well, thank you. We, we have so many comments here, people loving what you're saying. And, uh, you know, um, I've shared some of them on screen. So thank you, everybody, for, for your feedback. Uh, we still have about 10 more minutes. If anybody else has any questions, uh, I'd be, uh, we'd be happy to consider them and try to answer them. And I know Dr. Tuttle, Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. You have you have so so much insight and so appreciate everything you're saying. I to have to be patient is so important. And and the concept of of 
not stressing ourselves is so important. And all, all that you're saying is we so love it and really hope that you can join us again as we we dry, dive a little deeper into spirituality, into self-healing, into self-care. Uh, keep talking about planting the seeds with patience. And I, I suppose I, I'm going to change my language around that a little bit and, and not just planting seeds, but planting seeds with patience and love. <laughs> and so thank you for, for all of that. Um, uh, th this is so beautiful. Uh, for me, I've, I've noticed that there are some people who are vegan, who are religious, and they have their religious messaging, and perhaps uh, we can give them a voice too, so they can carry it through the through religion and into religion. Um, you know, our mission is to to amplify everybody's voice and and to be the center where where an ambassador can turn, no matter what what the opportunity is. So, be it a, a religious opportunity, or be it about climate healing, or be it about a health condition, uh, we want to be the resource that that will support them in having a successful opportunity to patiently plant seeds. Um, best practices, uh, yeah, um, there we go, Jeff, best practices for guiding people to find the inner connection. So yes, Jeff wants to know about best practices for guiding people to find their inner connection. Yeah, that's a good question. And uh, thank you, thank you, Peter, for um, your comments too. I think that the um, the main thing, and there's there's probably a, a few different ways to look at this, but I think that uh, when we talk about practices to to find our inner connection, uh, first of all, veganism as a foundation, I think, is very important. So we'll just, that goes kind of without saying. But as long as we're eating animal foods, that's cutting off our connection. I would say while you're at it, try to make your diet not only a plant-based vegan diet, but also organic as well. Organic is really important nowadays because the chemical industry is really going overboard with glyphosate and other toxic chemicals that are in everything now. So I think... Uh, these things are really devastate the uh, microbiome in our in our gut uh, and when that happens uh, then there's a direct connection between the microbiome in our gut through the vagus nerve to the emotional centers in our brain and if the bacteria and the microbiome in our gut has been even if we're vegans if we're not eating healthy vegan food organic and uh, whole foods I think are better than processed foods if we have a healthy microbiome and the bacteria are bacteria are happy, then we will feel much happier in general. If they're not happy, we're not going to be happy. You know that old saying, if mama's not happy, nobody's happy. <laughs> if the bacteria's not happy, nobody's happy. Because that, that base, there, the basic thing is there's a really, this is only being understood in the last several years uh, more clearly, but um, we have all kinds of uh, emotional uh hormones and so forth that get activated and, and if there's a struggle down in our gut not only is it physically uh, our health physically challenged but there's mental uh, there's a sense of anxiety that can come a sense of frustration and so forth so eating a really healthy diet is important another practice i of course i emphasized um, meditation already but i think really being uh conscious of our thoughts like when you first when you have an opportunity like i have an opportunity when i wake up in the morning to make a discipline or a practice of giving thanks right just giving thanks for another day another opportunity to learn to grow to share to contribute to, and just however you want to do it individually but to just connect with that that thought but also the feeling of joy that we have another wonderful day another opportunity and let that feeling just go in every cell of your being that your body is uh, your vehicle that what you are is eternal consciousness and your physical body is your vehicle and let and and be grateful that you have this vehicle and 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 uh and let that feeling go deep and then and then have a morning ritual i think it's really good to have a morning ritual that connects you with your true nature 
So what I do, for example, I do that and then, and then do some water, different things and cleansing the sinus and so forth. And then, and then, then meditate, right? I sit quietly and uh, I take about two hours for this, you know, so meditation and then some yoga or some kind of exercise is good. Maybe journal writing, writing, you know, letting yourself write uh, what you feel um, wants to come through can be very helpful. Uh, taking time, I take a swim in the lake down below, and, um, and then I play the piano <laughs> after after the two hours over. I you know, do something creative. I think you know, creativity uh, is really important, and very helpful. Uh, connecting uh, in a positive way. If there's people in your life, like at that point, my wife Madeline and I will have a connection. Make sure we have a really loving connection to start our day. And do, try to be as conscious as possible of these things and, and really get that foundation, the spiritual foundation uh, settled before opening up the emails and doing all the other stuff. Because I, the mind uh, will get busy and perturbed and upset uh, by these things. So you want to make sure you take time in the beginning of the day. That's, at least that's how I look at it. That's what I've been doing. I've been doing this you know, for 50 years. And I think uh, it's helpful because... Uh, the, the, we're resonant beings and we create a resonance. And, it, and the whole idea in many ways is to raise the frequency of our vibration because we're, in a sense, we're living in a society where we're being bombarded all the time with low vibrational messages, low vibrational uh, advertising <laughs> and fear and uh, competition and consumerism, all these things, you know, the news, all this stuff. So if, we, if we're not consciously maintaining a high vibrational state, we're going to get dragged down, and that's good for business, right? I mean, they don't haven't made any money on me. The pharmaceutical industry has made no money on me in 50 years. I have not gone to a drugstore in 50 years and bought anything except maybe some Band-Aids once. But I just stay out of the medical, I, I'm completely out of it. I don't, I don't use it because I take responsibility for my health. But the only way to do that is to keep a high vibration. And we, we stay above those kinds of, of thoughts and feelings and the mass consciousness. And meditation is important. There's many different types of meditation. I, I hate to tell you what one to do, but you know, to find your way, there's basically being aware of our breathing. You know, real br breath is so important. Most of us in our society, we're never taught how to breathe properly. Most people in our society are taking shallow breaths all the time and shallow breathing creates anxiety and, and a sense of, of disconnectedness. So if you just being aware of breathing throughout the day and let the breath go deep to the diaphragm, it's hard to be upset when you're breathing deeply and slowly and relaxed and the whole body is energized by that. Exercise is important too. You know, all, all kinds of exercise and, and questioning everything about our society, the way we do everything. I mean, I, I'm, I'm radical, you know, I, in, our, in, our, in our house, we don't have furniture. We don't, I don't sit in a chair and you know, we, we have cushions on the floor. I'm, I'm on the floor all the time. I figure if I'm on the floor, I can't fall down. <laughs> so it's on the floor <laughs> and everything's on the floor. So I think, you know, just question the, the way that our society does things. Because for the most part, our society does things that are in a way that's not that healthy. Um, so move, you know, movement, uh, exercise, aerobic, yoga, tai chi, qigong, all these things are really helpful. Breathing. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. Going into cold water uh, regularly. I mean, water. Water is another thing. And sun and nature. You know, people are afraid of the sun. I think it's really a big mistake to be afraid of the sun. If we're, I have not worn, also haven't worn um, sunscreen probably for 50 years either, because I, my skin has gotten, like uh, you know, used to the, a lot of sun, so it, it's, it works. But um, so many we put all these things on our skin that are toxic. I mean, if, read the labels. That's another thing. Uh, there's so many toxic chemicals in almost everything. So tr to try to really question. I think one of the most important things to stay connected is just question everything we're buying and putting on our skin and cleaning all, everything in our, in our, around us not only should it be vegan but without chemicals chemicals really disturb us much more than i think we realize and so the more that we can take responsibility for the way we're living and 
quality of our consciousness, the quality of our relationships. The greatest healer in many ways is nature, the sun, um, water, forest. There's a whole, there's a whole um, practice from in ancient Japan called forest bathing. Just going out in the forest. <laughs> just, you don't have to do anything. Just go out and be in nature. Your whole body, you, we are nature. The, one of the main problems we have, I think, while we're not healthy is that we're living in human constructed boxes with artificial lighting, artificial heating, artificial noise and sound and everything. Get out in nature and breathe and uh, take time to be silent. Silence is the best thing. Just listen internally and uh, really be careful about the, what you're eating, that it's, there's not toxins in it, water and air also purify your, your, purify your water. All these things affect the body and mind are not separate. So anything that brings disharmony into our body will do the same thing for our mind. So to try to really understand these things and again, realize that the governmental agencies have been completely captured. They are not going to protect you. You have to read label. We have to read labels and, and be proactive in everything. Just be proactive. Take responsibility. Grow your own food as much as you can or, or know the people who are growing it if you can. Support local decentralized farmers markets. Create community. That's really important. All these things go together. The main thing is connecting internally and then with everything we're doing outside of us. So those are a few tips, and I know it's past time, so we have to wrap it up here. But thank you very much, everyone, for your kind attention. And um, I really wish you all the best for these uh, wonderful holiday season that we have. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much for the, the blessed words and the energy. This, I mean, this powerful enlightenment. I mean, it, it's expansive. Your energy is a beautiful gift to the world and everyone that's watching. Thank you for everything you're doing for our planet, for the animals. And always remember to take care of yourself because it begins with you, right? You loving yourself first. I mean, compassion for yourself spreads to the whole world. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> that's very true. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. And thanks, thanks everyone. And, and before we sign off, I, I'd love to add my appreciation, uh, Dr. Tuttle and Marquita. You, you've added some beautiful thoughts too. And thank you everybody for joining us. I would like to invite everybody watching live and watching on YouTube in the future. After you watch this, please take a minute, write down three things that you've learned. Write down a couple things that you're going to commit to do differently. Write down a couple things that, that you commit to, to remember and be mindful and aware of as, as you go through through your life. And then please stay connected. Uh, tell your friends and people you know in your community to, to watch this. This is such an amazing uh, interview and and interview may not be the best word but dr tuttle shared so much amazing wisdom with us and i love the concept of, of bringing spirituality in and please stay connected and keep watching and watching for all the wonderful things we're going to be doing hopefully wonderful things here in the future and hopefully we'll get dr tuttle back with us and maybe lead us through some exercises with with mindfulness and, and spirituality. And with that, um, I'm ready to end this as we are over time. And I'll end with uh, Namaste Vegan. <laughs> right. <laughs> namaste Vegan. Namaste. Okay. Much love to all of you. Thank you very much. You. And we look forward to another time. Thank you. Thanks. Beautiful. Bye bye. <laughs>